So growing up, I wasn't fully conscious of it probably, but I spent most of my energy trying to hide things that what was going on with me. I hid in school what things were like at home. I hid with my friends about how kind of really off my parents were and try to turn that offness into like novelty. Like, yeah, my mom's cool. She lets me smoke, smoke her cigarettes. Isn't that cool? I tried to hide how unfinished and messy our house was. I tried to come off like that was bohemian, like by, by choice. Um, and I tried to hide that I wasn't growing up in this alcoholic and financially messy, chaotic mess of a place and growing up in neglect. So when clients get to me, I, I really relate to their stories about how they still had to hide and they may be still hiding these big dark things from say their, their therapist or their coworkers or even their partners. And that hiding isn't good. You know, secrecy separates us from intimacy that we want. And you could think about this video as a list of stuff you might have had to hide and that I've had to hide and that are actually super kind of appropriate things for growing up in childhood trauma. The biggest chunks of my personal growth and healing came from really good people and my therapist saying, you know, of course you hid that stuff. Uh, that was the right thing to do at the time. Of course you pretended to be somebody that you're not. Of course you lied about who your parents were. And of course you felt that way about those really hard things. Um, I want you guys to feel that same kind of level of relief and to really take the pressure off and start to normalize our issues around our childhood trauma because it, these things are way more common than you think. My mentor who I love would say to me, um, you can't learn new things when shame is running you. And I think that that is so true. You know, shame and secrecy is just more than hiding what we had growing up with. If you're new to me or new to the channel, welcome. If you like the video, you can hit some buttons on the screen. You can't miss with any of the buttons. If you're interested in exploring shame and the effects of it in our, in our present life, I'm doing a webinar at the end of October on October 30th, 2021, which is coming up. And that webinar is gonna be on Zoom. And you're welcome to just pop over to my website and sign up to register there. I'll have the link in the description of this video. The webinar is gonna cover how shame manifests in our childhood trauma trauma, what present life triggers to shame looks like, and it's also going to include an inner child worksheet on how to get ourselves out of shame triggers. Um, and there, I'll also be doing a live Q&A at the end in that webinar. The link will take you to my website where you can register for that webinar. You can also connect with me and you can also explore some e-course work that I offer there as well. So here's a list of five abnormally normal childhood trauma issues that we experience in our present lives. And all of them are very emotionally confusing and they're actually hard to talk about. So this could be triggering for some of you. So if you know, if you get triggered, just pause and come back to it when you're ready. We're just naming these here and I hope you can connect with Embrace that I've had many clients struggle with these, with these very things, including myself. And I'm not gonna be listing these in a in level of importance or severity. They're all sort of just kind of dark issues and difficult issues to unpack. So number one is being estranged from extended family. I often find that dysfunctional family systems are fragmented and estranged from each other. What this looks like is our parents don't keep consistent family connections going with their siblings, cousins, even their own parents. And the result of that is that you might even have, say, a cousin that lives in the same town as you, but you barely know them. And there's a whole family story to that. Later in life, if say you're getting married or that cousin is getting married, it is now incredibly awkward and not really knowing what to do with each other. And our inner child might feel immense shame about that, that we're not good enough at keeping those connections going. We might feel shame about not keeping up with them. We might feel shame about our abusive nuclear family system as it is, and those cousins, aunts, uncles, the extended family might know that about us or know that we were raised in that, which is another source of shame. And ideally, I really think it's up to the job of the adults in the family system to keep family relationships going, not the children. Um, so it's quite normal to not know that cousin or an uncle or an aunt fully if, if Growing up, the parents didn't cultivate that connection. That wasn't our ch uh, the job of children. 
Um, if we also feel shame around our nuclear family, like who our parents were or what happened to us, that's also not on us, not on us from a place of shame within the context of the whole extended family. As adults, we can we can reach out and we can try to start connections, but it's also not on us if it's not reciprocal. They may not how to do, they being the extended family, they may not know how to keep connections going too because of generational trauma in a way that it's like nobody knows what to do with each other but we may feel personal shame about that like as if it's on us which is the point to this one there's a couple of uh, some some additional issues as you might have been told that your grandmother was awful and that a, la a meeting later in life with that grandmother turns out that that's really not the kind of case and it's just like we may we may have these stories about who these people were that aren't actually really the truth could be another part to it another issue is that highly toxic parents can have axes to grind meaning let's just say that dad made a mom cut off her own parents because he hated them or he like sort of wanted to sort of separate her from her parents or vice versa that mom refused to include her in-laws in anything and they were they were evil and they were bad and you know it's it's hard to know with with all of this mess in our family it is hard to sort of know who to who to believe but sometimes that is sort of warranted and sometimes it's not warranted another component to the estrangement and the dysfunction in this so what I've learned from hearing about from hearing hundreds of genograms in my in my in my private practice a genogram is your family map of dysfunction your family tree of dysfunction and what I've learned is that the generational trauma um, really carries through the generations of this kind of disconnection um, those that disconnection can also be related as I mentioned before about huge schisms in the family like one brother doesn't talk to the brother because of some kind of business deal gone wrong and they haven't talked to each other in 20 years and then that's your uncle and then that's your dad. And my point to expressing that is, again, I know that this is repetitive, is it's not on you and it's it's you are just in the middle of it and it's not you're not responsible for that disconnection, nor are you responsible to carry the shame about it. Number two is very difficult. This is hiding that you grew up in a religiously abusive household or a cult. In the beginning of a person's recovery who grew up like that, this one is really hard to share with anyone, and if, whether it's a close friend, a support group, a therapist, or even a partner. In no way here am I saying that all spiritual practices, whether individual or community-based, are bad. I think spiritual practices can be very helpful to our mental health, and I, I don't think that beliefs that help us find meaning or purpose in our lives or negative or detrimental to us. What I do define as abusive here is growing up in a family system that defaults all parenting, emotional care, explaining the world, explaining general life, things like sex or gender or chain of events or even reality. When they do that through spiritual and religious interpretations only, that's what I think is abusive. Such as say, refusing medical care, to children due to believing that a higher power is all that is needed. There is an abusive betrayal of the parent-child contract while shaming and blaming and gaslighting a child into thinking they aren't worthy enough of God's healing. And that child can't say, like that child can't reconcile that their wrist is still broken and painful in a, del in a delusional system like that, meaning that the child is aware that it's not, it still hurts, it's, you know what I mean? It's, they're aware of that disreality between what the parents are sort of saying and what's going on with it. And as a side note, in the United States, that kind of abuse would, would if, they, if it was found out about, that would cue child and family services, or if a school nurse saw that the wrist has been broken and it's been broken for two weeks, that school nurse would be required to get child and family services involved. It's that sort of abusive. This is just one example of how religious, overly religious families and cults can become abusive to children. Um, clients who grew up in that kind of level of fundamentalism um, and have maybe found their way out, they may greatly struggle with reclaiming getting medical care when needed, or their trauma might be deeply rooted in not being believed when they're ill, or they're gonna have issues around being sort of sick or needing medical care, and that's sort of symptoms of the trauma, which are appropriate symptoms. And whether it's a religious organization or a cult, they can be both. 
Um, there are abusive dynamics from parents like controlling children as devout members and listing all non-members in society as bad or as, e as, or as like evil. And it's, it's highly damaging to a child's development specifically around perception that say if you're five and you're growing up in a system like that, it's really hard to know that the kid that you're in daycare with is going to be like, you know, damned in society because they're not like you. So a lot of a lot of abuse around perception with this one. In cults and in fundamentalist religious organizations, there's a marked use of things like mind control, authoritarianism, totalistic membership, divide and conquer, which is sort of strategies that dictators will use to use. It's almost like a Cartman dr drama triangle about using sort of persecutor, victim, rescuer to sort of separate people and control people. It's actually really effective. And that's a very prevalent sort of tool that is used in the administration of these organizations to keep um, individual members and families really under sort of lock and key and also making it harder for them to sort of leave if they would sort of get there. So when nuclear families are wrapped up in fundamentalism or cults like this, I see that the childhood trauma survivors have to address the abuse in their recovery on two fronts. The first is that the parents were selling out their life, their choices, their children, and sometimes even their livelihoods to the organizations themselves. That's betrayal of the children and it's highly damaging. Um, such as when a client, say, wasn't protected from an, the abusive leaders and the parents welcomed those leaders into their lives and defaulted all the parenting and decisions to those leaders. There is also a, a direct abuse from the parents themselves to weaponize the dogma, like sort of saying, well, that happened because God doesn't like you or you're not pious enough or you're not sort of paying attention to the rules enough and explaining things in that way. That's what I mean about weaponizing it, that there's always this shameful, you're bad and you're not, you're not sort of a good enough member. If you were a good enough member of this thing, you would be doing better. So the second thing that the person will have to sort of do some recovery around, work around is the, the organization itself, meaning that um, to look at how kids don't organically get to choose their friends. They don't get to find their own identity. They lose their true self because they were told to do like the door-to-door -door cold calling and the door-to-door -door work or they're told to achieve some unattainable level of perfectionism and they're told to be selfless and compliant and they're told to shame others who may be wandering from the from the doctrine or the dogma. There's almost like a level of paranoia to it. Um, I've had clients who as children, like I said before, were refused medical care. They had to make daily cold calls as teenagers um, to get people involved into the cult. Like you come home from school and you have to do your calls and the awkwardness of that and having to leave your body to just sort of pay attention, to just be present at such a mind effy kind of experience to do all that. Um, and, you know, to also to kind of gone through a level of almost like systemic paranoia around who is in and who is out. And I really can't articulate all the fear based magical thinking and mind effing that goes on in these systems. I've had clients who were handed over to their abusers by their own parents. I've had clients told that the reason that they were hurt or assaulted was because of divine punishment and that they deserve it. They deserved it because of. Mr. So-and-so, they deserved it because of God. So there really are sort of two issues of business to finish in my mind for children who grew up like this and then they've somehow miraculously have gotten out of the system. It's very difficult for the survivor to open up about this, especially when they were conditioned to think that the outside world is just full of evil actors, like psychology is evil or the band queen is evil or sex is evil or makeup is evil or Disney is evil and it'll all corrupt you. The fear of those things is just a powerful way to control and obtain compliance from members. You know, recovery for survivors will be about embracing that they experienced normal repression of self in a, a horrifically abnormal situation. And to say, you know, of course you feel so other than. You know, you were conditioned to think that way and it'll take a long time for you to just simply be a person in the world. Um, and to not so not be so fr afraid of you or afraid of the world. And the last thought here is, there's a heartbreaking grief. I really want you really want to like sort of honor this. There's really a heartbreaking grief that if if you got out of systems like that. 
there's a lot of heartbreak around those who you were close to that didn't and they stayed in it. There's such a schism there. Number three is not feeling joy when good things happen. You know, realizing this one is actually what got me into therapy or, or actually someone else noticed that I was sort of not experiencing joy during good things and I would really be shut down and really ho-hum about big celebratory things that would come up in my life. And I think we need those moments that other people pointed out to us. It's painful, but it's also stuff that we're already kind of aware of and they're just addressing what we see as well. What this one looks like is that when there is a graduation, a marriage, a new job, getting a scholarship, even having a baby, it can feel to trauma survivors anticlimactic and that we don't really know what to do with it because we don't really feel much. We might, we might know that something's up, we might have a feeling like, shouldn't I feel more? But we're kind of like, meh, you know, and um, we really don't like that we have that response and it's a, it can even be a little bit scary. It's highly normal for childhood trauma survivors to not experience the full spectrum of emotions, including joy. That's what it was like for me. And I struggled in this surreal way with not feeling joy at joyous moments. And I also had a really hard time with knowing how to be spontaneous. I see those two things as kind of intertwined, joy and spontaneity. Um, these are hard things to admit to because like most of these things, we feel like we, we might be somewhat dead inside, which isn't true. Um, we just don't want to be seen like that. We don't want to be seen that we're dead inside, so we might try to cover it up is what I mean. I really worried that if, if I was this profoundly broken person because I didn't feel what others felt. And growing up in abuse and neglect and dysfunction, we shut down our emotions and we go into our heads as children, which is what is sort of the, the not feeling joy is, is kind of a byproduct of that. This is also known as dissociation, almost like a baseline not being in our body because the priority would be to be watching out for what happens next and watch out for how to get through things. Or the whole household is really repressed and shut down and there's really no spark to life. We'll approach our own college graduation as getting through it rather than feeling the joy and the relief about moving out and celebrating. Um, that's not possible if joy and spontaneity and grief and all those other emotions are buried. So it actually makes sense. So, you know, it's very normal for trauma. You're not a freak or you're not a monster if you're really feeling meh about big things. It's just a sign that there's an emotional work to do like talking about it, processing some trauma. It's like, um, this, I think good therapy and good childhood trauma is a lot about almost like jump-starting a dead battery. That's almost, you could almost, right before I started my therapy work, it was just really like a, like a dead battery that just needed a good kind of like clear. And we can get those emotions back. I want to be clear about that. So, but what we do is we kind of hide those feelings and we kind of play along. We also might find that adrenaline-based activities like drugs or sex or jumping out of a plane or something like that can almost jumpstart that feeling of joy. But at the end of it, it always kind of leads back to shut down the feelings after. So those things don't really sort of solve the issue. Number four is kind of a mouthful. Um, not liking or fully valuing tenderness and empathy towards self or to the vulnerable. I know that that's quite a bit of a title, but it's another really normal thing and is incredibly hard to admit to for childhood trauma survivors. What I mean is experiencing some level of disgust about being tender to ourselves or others. What it looks like is having disdain for our inner child or even blame that inner child for your life being a mess. You don't have to fully like the concept of the inner child and some people really struggle with it, but what I mean is having disdain or disgust or hatred towards yourself when you think about yourself as a child or you see pictures of yourself as a child. It also looks like having contempt and disgust when we see children being taken care of emotionally or that we imagine that they're being coddled. And sure, sometimes kids are coddled, but I don't even like that word, but um, what I'm describing in a sense is a disgust for empathic parenting or empathic relationships. We might even balk at believing that it's real when we see it sort of going on in others. This can also look like having an inner dialogue that tends to be cold or really nasty towards self. Um, like is our inner monologue about ourselves voiced through like angry clenched teeth, like you better not F this up this time. 
um, like you do everything else. And that is a clue that you might have this kind of going on. What I call this very common symptom of childhood trauma is self-flogging or self-hate. And there's a really good reason why we do it. When children are treated with contempt, contempt becomes their inner vibe. That becomes their inner voice. And this is especially true for clients who grew up in what I call anti-love families. Children will also hate themselves and start to blame themselves for their circumstance, believing that if they were stronger or more focused or just better, then they could rise above the things you know, that is about their abuse that is beyond their control within their abusive family. When that doesn't work because it's impossible for a 10 year old to rise above all that stuff, we start to hate ourselves. So I look at it as being twofold. It's how we talk to and we also take it on when we can't overcome. I've even had clients painfully admit that they really dislike children or seeing children get their needs met. And to that I say, you know, of course that's there. Like you were treated awful for having those needs and you're just feeling what you know, but it's also with the vibe of like, you know, like I didn't need care and attention, why do you? Like there's a judgment going on in the background of it. Valuing a child in a child's world really got wrecked. The concept of like sort of what kids needs or kids being appreciated. Recovery for this is going to be about really checking in with what you really value about parenting and kids and also clearing the air with yourself. Sometimes with the clients who have self-hate going on, I have them say to their inner child stuff like, I think we don't really like each other and I think we need to be real about that. Let's not be fake with each other. Um, as we both really don't want this relationship, but we do need to work together. And it might have to start with almost like a frenemy vibe where it's unrealistic to have a person who is struggling with self-hate to totally shift gears into this really loving, affirmative language. It's not gonna work for them. So we have to start somewhere with it. Self-hate is often a way to survive instead of really taking in what the family system is like or realizing at eight, we have 12 years to go until we're 18 to survive this miserable system. So lastly on this, like with most of these, to shift that idea of self-hate or disdain or disgust or contempt as look at it as sort of a symptom of what we experience in our, in, our, in, our, in our family systems. To also check in, to really kind of awaken, what do I value? Do I value children growing up and thriving and sort of getting their needs met? Of course we do, but it's just not sort of our experience. So we do have to be real with ourselves and start somewhere, but it is very fixable. Number five is also difficult. This one is hiding our true feelings when an abusive parent passes away. This one's very hard, but not for reasons you might think. When a survivor of childhood trauma loses an abusive parent, they are usually stuck not knowing how to feel or not knowing how to process. What it usually looks like is not feeling much and then experiencing worry or shame that they're not feeling much. And there is usually a worry that they're somewhat of a monster or they for not having grief or shock or even compassion. But in reality, it's totally normal to not feel much and to feel confused when we lose an abusive parent. Why is that? Well, the, that abusive parent broke a family and parent-child contract by being abusive. Once that takes place, much of the traditional death of a parent feelings are no longer warranted. But we may feel like freaks about the feelings, which, and that really isn't good for us. I tell clients that the sexually, physically, or emotionally abusive parent who has now passed on is perhaps a closing of a chapter in their trauma life. I also might ask them if they feel like the relationship connection passed away many years ago or was never there. And that's another sort of reality to kind of look at. I, if you think about someone who loses a parent who's, who's struggled with Alzheimer's for the past eight or 10 years is they often say that, you know, like once my dad kind of got sick in that way, it's like I lost him then. And then he became like a different sort of person. It's sort of in a similar way and in, in for childhood trauma in a way that the relationship had passed away a long time ago or was never there. It can often just feel like losing like a teacher from high school that you had that one year and that teacher was a nightmare. Like we don't rejoice in their death, but we don't really feel a big connection to that person because that person was almost just someone to endure and to kind of like get, get away from. I'm not saying who cares that they died. 
This is, this is the passing of someone who most likely we need to do a lot of processing around in therapy in our recovery. There could be, you know, there, but there could also be an emotional freedom or feelings of safety once that parent has passed on in our subconscious, especially if that parent was like a horrific predator. So it's actually appropriate to not know what to feel. You know, death is the main surreal experience we have as humans. No one knows what to do with it. And I think if they do, they're kind of BSing. It's just such a, it's just such a different reality when someone, when you had a coworker that was there on a Tuesday, no longer there on a Wednesday as human beings. I think it just messes with us and it's part of being human about not really knowing what to do with it. Um, and I had this client one time, and I'll, I'll finish with this, is this is one of the most powerful experiences that I've done in, in group therapy. Um, this client that I had was really terrified of their parent, toxic, very highly abusive toxic parent, hadn't passed on yet, but they were getting up in years. And the client was worried about having to go to the services and have everybody from soup to nuts say how great their parent was because the parent was a charmer. The parent could really sort of pull the wool over people's eyes. And in group, we did this experiential where, um, experiential is an exercise where you kind of call up the trauma in a good enough way, but you have a different outcome. So this, we kind of did this almost like theater thing where we represented like a, a wake and a funeral for the parent who has passed. And the receiving line would have been people sort of saying, um, your parent was so great. They they did this, you know, every time that I would come to the house, they would always have a smile and like strangers would, you know, come to this thing or, or nurses or whatever, or neighbors, you know, you must be devastated. And the, the client was, was able to practice and saying, um, that was not my experience of my parent. I had a totally different experience. I appreciate what you're saying, but that was not my reality. And that was just a very powerful experience for them to go through to be able to sort of tell the truth about who the parent was. So I tell you that story that this stuff is is very powerful to us about when we lose sort of an abusive parent. So I hope that that was helpful. I wanted to address these things that we tend to hide from and name them as normal for growing up in childhood trauma. They can be very isolating. They can be secrets that we really don't want others to know or that we have going on, but the relief to hear them called out or to hear them talked about was huge for me. Um, and to just feel like it's just, it's just all normal stuff and there's nothing wrong with you. Um, if you identified with any of these, you could do some of these journaling prompts. Here are two very simple journaling prompts. The first is, what do I feel about myself when one of these secrets comes up? And incidentally, it can be, it doesn't have to be one of these five secrets. It could be secrets about sex. It could be secrets about anything. I'm just giving you five off the top of my head. Um, is it true that I'm bad somehow in it or could it actually be normal given what my family system was like? Is it me or is it the system that I was born in? And I will have these two journal prompts in the description of the video in case you guys sort of lose it. The second journaling prompt is what it might feel if I embrace the normalcy around this issue. Would I be less burdened? Would I feel more human rather than feeling separate? Can I gradually accept that my story is more about my family dysfunction rather than me being faulty? You know, they are incredibly hard to even bring up with a therapist, much less partners or friends, and underneath them is the shame. And you're welcome to join me for that webinar coming up. Again, the link will be in the description of this video. And if you identify, if you identify strong with one of these, let me know in the comments that, uh, if, that I've just sort of touched on, if you want these to be more flushed out, if you want sort of more of a longer video on it or an e-course, I would love to hear that from you. And as always, you guys, I hope this was help, video was helpful to you. And as always, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well, may you be peaceful and at ease, and may you be joyous. Take care and I will see you next time.